Welcome. You've got digital folklore. Hey, Perry. Hey. Um, glad you were able to make some time today. Yeah, no, I got the place all ready for us. Check it out. Oh, yeah, it's super clean. Yeah, man. After the road trip, uh, I didn't really feel like editing. I felt like I should clean the whole thing up just in case, you know, I got a visit from the police or something. <gasps> did did you ever figure out what happened to our feet? Okay, sure. I, I guess I don't I guess I don't want to talk about it either. Um yeah. Well, I figured out that it wasn't us. I mean, which we knew. I'd like tried to trace the IP address, but I just went to some data center somewhere, so they're probably using a VPN. The thing that I'm most worried about is that that is it's out there in our RSS feed confusing people. We've already seen like an article written about it. We've seen some people on our Discord server with all this weird speculation about what's going on. I, th I think we just need to figure out how to how to kill it. But if, um, we, I don't, if we just delete it, then it's it's gone, and like we don't have evidence of it. I mean, I could save a copy, or I could put a copy on the website. That way. Like it's still there, but it's just not cluttering up the feed. And then we have it as evidence. Yeah, we'll have it as evidence. We'll be able to take a look at it. So, okay. So I'll delete it from the feed and I'll, th I'll throw it up on our website. Okay. We've got to do the recording for the next uh, folk episode, right? We're going to run the interview with Tara. I think that's why I'm here <laughs> anyway. Um, I know we we're tired and confused. There's been a lot going on over the past few days, but yeah, let's, let's uh, figure out that episode. Yeah, it's been a little bit busy. I got our setup nice. Digby's not here to uh, bug us this time, so we should we get the place to ourselves. Oh, that's the difference. It smells better too. I don't. You can. Why don't you sit on the other side of the table? I'm gonna swing. I'll swing the mic arm around, and you can sit over there, and I'll sit over here. Okay. And I'll just I'll um, I'll use this mic. That good? Yep, you're coming yep, through. You got it. All right. Um. Anyway, so where where is? Digby, where's the little guy? A little bit echoey in here. Uh, Digby's at the vet. Is, is he okay? Oh, yeah, he's fine. I mean, he's, he's getting yeah, a... The last time I saw him, he was eating... I, I don't even know what that was over in your corner. Yeah, but he, he always eats that. No, he's fine. He's, he's, getting, it's, he's getting a procedure done. It's not exactly the vet, um, but he, you'll see. I mean, he'll be back in a week or two. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I know he, he helps you with your editing and stuff and... If we can get him back soon, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and when he comes back, he's going to be hopefully a little bit more helpful uh, if, if things pan out. <sighs> I'm scared. Um, let's let's get rolling on this. Uh, so I have the tape for the Terra interview. I've got that queued up. Right. Uh, we should probably... This is the loudest chair in the world, Mason. Yeah, I know. It was quieter when there's stuff on it, but I figured I would clean it up Damn, nice. Too creaky and slippery at the same time. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit loose. Just hold still. It'll be fine. Okay. So we gotta get we gotta punch in. Uh, do the you know the this is I'm Perry. I'm Mason. This is Digital Folklore. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any content warnings for this one. So right, uh, right. I guess we'll just jump in with that uh, about LARPing. Okay. Cool. Um, so we'll have you set that up uh, once we get going. All right. Okay. So I'm rolling, and then uh, yeah, whenever you're ready, just do your. I'm Perry Carpenter thing. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Perry Carpenter. And I'm Mason Amadeus. And this is the Digital Folklore Podcast. Can we get one of just saying this is Digital Folklore? And this is Digital, digital Folklore. Nice. And then I'll, you know, glitch that out and we'll have the... <laughs> and then we'll go into, I guess, us setting up the interview. Okay. So yeah, you, you, you set it up. I'll, I'll chime in. All right. Let me get the, uh, let me get the narration voice. So over the past few episodes, we've been talking a lot about folk groups and ARGs and legend tripping and just kind of a side journey with that. Someone reached out to me on Facebook and she is an expert LARPer. Her name is Tara Marie Clapper. And what we found out is that this, this idea of live action role play is really something that dovetails nicely with these other topics. When you think about uh, LARPing, when you think about live action role play, you have these groups of people coming together. Those are folk groups. You have a game aspect that is both physical and virtual in a lot of ways. So there's an alternate reality game component of that. And then in physical space where they're actually um, ostensing into the real world and participating in these things. And that is an interesting summary of what LARPing is. 
And something I thought was really fascinating in this interview that Tara talked about was the depth at which these live action role play scenarios can explore much deeper topics and hard topics. Uh, one of the things she talks about in this interview is marginalized groups or oppressed people can participate in these and either be a part of a world in which that oppression does not exist for them and feel sort of more free, or some of the scenarios that they play through can mirror aspects of that and help people face those things and be in a situation like that and, and empower themselves in different ways through the practice that they gain experiencing it inside of this fictional world. Tara puts it a lot better than I could, um, but it, it's, it's a really fascinating aspect because it's way more than I ever really thought about when it comes to LARPing. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tara puts it better than both of us can because she is the expert in this. So I think um, we can get the interview queued up, let people hear what Tara has to say, and then we can come back and maybe wrap up with a few closing thoughts. Perfect. So I'll I'll chop that up. I'll tighten that up. Uh, maybe we drop an ad break for like, like you know a minute or two, and then right into the interview. Yeah. Okay. So then we'll put the ad break. We'll just cut out glitchy sound, glitchy sound, glitchy sound. And then the glitchy sound goes away, uh, and the ads are over, and we just roll the tape. My name is Tara Clapper, she, her pronouns. I am an analog game designer, a freelance writer, and then I work full-time in the defense industry doing marketing and content creation. So I have a few different roles. Analog game designer, do you mean like, like tabletop, like board games, things like that? I am working on a tabletop game now. I am most known for designing LARPs or live action role playing games. And I've run them at conventions, but in 2017, I actually started running LARPs online. So it works the same way it does in person. You're talking to someone else as though you're speaking in character. I'm talking to you, character to character, only it's done like on Zoom. And so my game that I started as a LARP on Zoom is a sci fi game. So the technology is like part of the game. So you're not really destroying your immersion to participate on a video chat. So that's the kind of stuff I do. So I'm most known for doing the digital live action games. And I started in 2017 and then the pandemic happened and suddenly everybody was very hungry for that. I kind of want to dig into that because live action role playing is something I feel like people generally either don't know what it is or have some idea in their head that's like not realistic. And also like... That's an interesting folk group. And I'm curious, I just want to like dive, dive into LARP in general. What is LARP, I guess, for people who don't know? LARP stands for Live Action Role Playing. It was originally an acronym, but now it's kind of used as just a word, kind of like SCUBA was an acronym, but now we just call it SCUBA. And it covers a very wide variety of participatory experiences. Everything from nerds beating each other up in the park with boffer weapons, which are like padded foam swords to really high budget, immersive, low mechanics games where you're, it's very cinematic. It feels like you're in a movie. And those are actually the kinds of, of LARPs that I gravitate more towards now, but I've played a whole bunch. And there's a big range in between where you assume characters and play the roles like at a convention or as I design online, you could even do face-to-face -face on Zoom. And it ranges from the mechanical, so it would have rules more like a board game, to the theatrical, which is more like going to a play except you're participating. Uh, there's a friend of mine, Ben, who's very big in, in uh, live action role play in Britain. Uh, and we were talking about some of like the immersive exhibits or things you see at like Disney where they have the immersive suites. And something he said that has stuck in my brain, he was just like, everybody just wants to LARP but won't admit it or doesn't know it which I thought was interesting because immersive experiences have been a whole thing. Yeah. I'm curious about the lore of the story of the, the roles that you're assuming and the ways you interact, because presumably you, you'd probably end up being with sort of a core group of people, but then there's these bigger events. How does it handle, like, is it often in like taking place inside of existing universes and canons, or is it, is there some kind of mutual understanding of shared canon building or lore building? Like, how does that aspect of it work? LARP is such a wide variety of different types of experiences that the answer is so often yes and no. But usually there is some kind of set lore. And by the way, the cruise director for the Star Wars experience in Disney World is actually someone who has a LARP and immersive theater background. I know them and got to attend one of their productions 
So if people are calling it a Star Wars LARP, it's largely accurate. That's definitely in the vein of LARPing. It's very, very close to to what we do as a LARP. But yeah, there's usually some kind of, just like it would be if you went to Disney and participated in the Star Wars experience, there is a shared lore there. And Star Wars is a great example because everybody kind of knows the same lore. They've seen the same movies. So when they're stepping into this consensual reality, they're dealing with the same kind of stories and the same kind of backgrounds, right? And then you're just kind of inserting your own character into it. And in certain systems or settings, there are moments for every character, for every person playing their character to shine. I love the phrase consensual reality. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fantastic because everybody's kind of opting in to a shared vision and then In a well-run experience, you also have safety rules. So along with consent comes safety rules like how do you depict combat? Is it okay to depict romance? All of that kind of stuff. How do you indicate that you want more or less intensity? Because you can get really into it and start like yelling and screaming and having a fight. And the other person might be all about that. Or they might kind of want you to back off but continue the scene. So there are different rules and mechanics for every game to indicate that. And a lot of them are sort of put into gameplay. So, um, you know, one of the ones that we've used in in past games was if you were angry at me about the way I might have given your pet raccoon a dirty look, and I wanted to continue that, you know, angry role play, and I was okay with it, I could say, I really, really want to take this further and just end this confrontation. Let's have a duel. The indicative words would be, I really, really want to continue. So I'm telling you like, yes, let's escalate this scene. Let's fight about your raccoon. I'm down. <laughs> so just using using clear language and sending these, and everyone sort of agrees ahead of time, like that that's how they're going to talk. They're yeah. going to use those phrases. And most settings have like really specific phrases for that. And then also some more blunt rules, uh, like there's one that's called cut, which is similar to in tabletop. You usually use the X card where you hold up a card with an X on it. And that just says you're going to cut out that topic or what just happened. So if it's something sensitive and you don't want to continue down that path, you can do that and then cut it out. And then the game just kind of keeps going. Is there a a certain personality or demographic or anything that seems to be drawn to LARPs uh, and even the types of those, um, whether that's online or offline, more than more than uh, other personality types or demographics? I found that it's largely a haven for people who have felt like an outsider in one way or another. They're marginalized for a certain reason, and they want to do the best they can to kind of bring justice to the world or experience a world in which they are not constantly faced with injustice or where they can push back about it. So not every LARP is necessarily about that or centering that. But I found in the types of LARPs that I've been playing and running and writing that those are the people that it it tends to attract. And my LARPs kind of coincided with a brand I already had going. I used to run a website called The Geek Initiative. And it started as a site for women in geek culture because 10, 12 years ago, like the Mary Sue was really the only website doing that at all. And so I was like, okay, we need more. (laughs) So I started doing that on my own, got to go to conventions like New York Comic Con. It was like the ultimate nerd experience. And, you know, from there, um, got interested. I was already LARPing and I was started interviewing people who ran these more blockbuster, as they've called them, games that are more immersive, cinematic, take place on big campuses and stuff like that. Ultimately, it's it's people who want to tell a story and people who want to co-create stories. Yeah. And what what's the, what's the gateway? What's the, the toe in the water? And then how do you broaden that out after you've gotten some experience? Some people come into it from theater. Some people come into it from sports. But most people have traditionally come into LARP from a background of tabletop role-playing games, most popularly Dungeons & Dragons. Back when I started LARPing, I actually didn't really feel much of a place in Dungeons & Dragons because it was more combat-focused. It's a really good system for combat. 
And people who ran Dungeons and Dragons, primarily men, were often more focused on do a dungeon crawl and stuff like that. So even though the LARPs I was playing were like that, they felt more inclusive to me than sitting at the table. But now, because of shows like Critical Role, it's more socially permissible to be very storytelling focused and have a lot of finesse in your game mastering, both in tabletop and LARP. Once that started happening, I was like, thank you so much for doing this. Once the popular white guys do it, then like it kind of gives permission for everyone to like the thing that I was doing all along. So now these more story focused schemes have uh, more credibility because that's what it takes things in culture to get there. But the gateway for a lot of people has been role playing games. Uh, There are a lot of people that are now exposed to it through just kind of like fringe mentions. And there are I would say positive and negative depictions and fringe mentions in society. Most people now actually know what LARPing is. When I started, they didn't, but they might know the movie Role Models, or if they're more theatrical, they might come into it as like just being really open about it and open-minded because they're like, oh, so it's improv because it's very similar to improv theater. Like role-playing in general is is such an, an interesting and fascinating and fun thing. I'm trying to think of like ties into tying into folklore. The thought I had had, and I, I bet you it's wrong. And Perry, you would know more than I was if it's almost like a near real time ostention in a way, because you're acting out a story you're telling. That's, I think, exactly what it is. So if, if there is a lore that you're subscribing to, participating in and even changing as a player, um, well, then other people are then going and acting that out in the physical world or in the digital world. So they're they're taking something that's lore and turning that into an action in some way. So that is ostention. I have so much to say about that. I'm glad you you both took it in this direction because to me, storytelling is a spiritual mandate, right? I am not a religious person. I am very witchy. I'm very much about intentions and I'm focusing on something and because I'm focusing on something, I'm doing more of it. I'm saying more of it. I'm conditioning myself. I'm not manipulating the environment around me, but I'm like actively talking about these topics, for example. And then that is what makes my interaction with the environment or the other people build that lore and that story together. So if you play a lot of LARPs, like say you're not into the idea of having your personal freedoms restricted. This is one that comes up a lot with with LARPers who tend to um, often be rebellious in one way or another or um, are just very interested in, um, in protecting their own rights. If that is something that bothers you and you're in a role play environment where you can change it, then you're basically constantly conditioning yourself and putting it out there to the environment around you and practicing protecting like your own rights or your own personal sovereignty. And the idea is that if you condition yourself to do that enough, then when you go out there in the world, the next time someone comes up to you and is like, I'm just going to grab your hair, you know, for example, and you're like, yeah, no, I'm not okay with that, that you'll be more comfortable saying because you've already LARPed that so much. So there's like a therapeutic aspect to it that is a little, that's different than therapy, but can be used in conjunction with, you know, just this personal conditioning and intentions and stuff like that. If you're focusing on that and that's what you project to the world, then you're allowed to take that with you when you leave. And, And I think Mason, as someone with a theater background, this will sound really familiar to you. When we end LARPs, a lot of times we'll say, What's something you want to leave behind and what's something you want to take with you? So you could say, I want to leave behind the fact that I played the villain and she was a terrible person. (laughs) But I would like to take with me the fact that my character had very firm boundaries and felt very comfortable expressing those because I'd like to maybe be walked all over a lot less as a person in real life. So that's kind of how it works in practice. And that's something that Um, I think a lot of actors will probably find pretty familiar. That's great. It's practice and it gives you a safe space to sort of express those things or sort of or try to express those things that are difficult. 
uh, and then take it away. And it's also cathartic in a way, I would imagine. Extremely. Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. Like, just like if you play a character who gets to really kind of yell it out or cry it out, that's certainly a thing. It's certainly something that people play for different reasons. Maybe they don't get to express how they really feel in real life. I've spoken with a lot of men who LARP that say like, I feel like I'm only allowed to express anger, but when I LARP, I'm like allowed to cry or hug somebody, you know? So that can be really good for someone to be able to have a place to safely do that. And that's my favorite kind of style of LARP myself. I like to just let it all out. And, you know, I'm not saying you want to throw your, tr- your real life traumas on everybody you're interacting with, but as you're building the story together, as you're creating this lore together, it follows you through life in kind of sometimes instead of your trauma. And that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like as an example, the D&D group I played with, like one of, one of the arcs we did ended up dealing with a lot of grief and loss in this really interesting and tasteful way. And in, in a lot of ways, it's easier to deal with in a fictional scenario, but it also sort of helps you. It weirdly equips you, even though you know that it's not real what's happening. It sort of equips you to like put yourself in those shoes. Hey, we need to go to another ad break. Uh, we, we can't oh. forget that. People are expecting two within this segment. Right, 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 right. Okay, so we'll just stop it here and then we'll... Yeah, we'll, we'll just go and then come right back. Hey, it's Mason. And I wanted to tell you about a podcast that I think you'll enjoy. It's called Spirits. And it's a history and comedy podcast focused on everything folklore, mythology, and the occult. Told through the lens of feminism, queerness, and modern adulthood. Every week, mythology buff Julia and her childhood best friend Amanda get together to learn about a different story from mythology and folklore over drinks. That's everything from the mythological origins of major franchises like Lord of the Rings and Wonder Woman, to modern urban legends, to a roundup of werewolf stories from around the world. You can start listening with any of the over 300 episodes they've released over the last six years. There is so much to enjoy, whether you're here for analysis of mental health in mythology or creepy modern ghost stories. You can dive right in at spiritspodcast.com or search for Spirits wherever you download your podcasts. Okay, and then we can just, I'll just rewind a little bit here and we'll go back into it. Uh, Sweet. Okay. In a lot of ways, it's easier to deal with in a fictional scenario, but it also sort of helps you. It weirdly equips you, even though you know that it's not real what's happening. It sort of equips you to, like, put yourself in those shoes. We all have roles and almost kind of LARP in certain ways. I mean, you definitely, you code switch. You speak differently to your guests or people you encounter in the world as you might to your parents or your kids or your teacher or your boss, right? So we all do that and we wear different things. I mean, I'm sitting here being very comfy talking to you wearing a hoodie, but, you know, if I went to a business meeting, this isn't what I would wear. I even think about it as makeup. I used to not really wear makeup, even though it's kind of a cultural expectation for me to do as a woman. But once I started LARPing, I got really into it because not only is it regular makeup like you you see a lot of women wear, but um, different characters require different makeup. Maybe I'm a ghost and I'm you know, making my face really pale or I'm a warrior and I'm like simulating Wode with, you know, some cool face paint. Well, I played that character who wore this Wode, quote unquote, into battle. And I I wore the paint. I took it very seriously and, you know, researched what that really meant to people, you know, in the past. And then I used the same makeup. So when I had a very challenging business meeting, I wore it as eyeshadow and it looked like normal makeup because it was. But, you know, and I was wearing it normally. Um, But I was really LARPing. I was like bringing something with me that reminded me of that really badass character. That's really cool. That is cool. Set a psychological frame for your, or an anchor, essentially. Exactly. Um, And then said, yeah, because of this, I'm now able to more easily recreate the mindset of the person that I want to be in this moment. Exactly. That's that's just one thing you can do through LARPing, but that has been the most useful for me. I also did not have, uh, I had a pretty decent job when I started LARPing, but I was not in any kind of leadership role. And I wanted to be in a leadership role in my community and maybe at work. And LARP enabled me to earn a leadership role in the game and learn leadership skills, which I wouldn't have gotten to do in another way. But because of LARP, 
I was able to like try it out and step into that and then realize, oh, these are my strengths as a leader. And this is where I could use some work or maybe work better with somebody who has my weaknesses as their skills. And the things that you mentioned that you like to talk about, um, you talked about the life cycle of online groups and I'm assuming LARPing groups as well. What do you see as the life cycle there? How do, how do they begin, kind of form, mature, and then what's, you know, what are those end stages when you say, hey, it's time to move into a new kind of creation or just let it end? I've found that to be a big challenge in gaming communities when they're big. It happens less with like the same five people that get together and play D&D every week. Like in that small group, you're dealing more with people grow up or they move or they have kids and like you can adjust around five people's lifestyle most of the time. Adjusting around big events and changes in and out of your game world for 500 people is really, really hard. And it's sad because unless there's that planned part where everyone gets to have like their funeral for the story or like if you were in a play, you know when you're you generally know when your last performance is and you get to have that closing and then you have a cast party and you get to hang out with everyone and say goodbye. When you're a LARP community or really any other community doesn't have that and there are a lot of very close relationships that often happen even more intensely and more quickly because of the level of intimacy that role-playing can facilitate, it gets to be really intense. And then, you know, you add into that all the other things that everybody else deals with, whatever they're experiencing in their real life, whatever's going on politically, whatever's going on globally. I mean, you know, like it's hard to watch the invasion of Ukraine and then sit down and play D&D and just kind of push that from your mind. Like you might need to have a conversation where you talk about that with your group first and kind of let it out there and then get into play. So when you've been bringing things like that into your gaming or into your community for years and years, it can just build some really, really tough, challenging situations. So so a lot of groups definitely do have this life cycle. And, you know, when you've built this kind of like lore with your group, even done it to a degree where it actually impacts kind of other corners of the Internet or the real world. It's really tough to see that sort of go away sometimes. I guess it's it's interesting in all of the different ways that it can help and harm and how it can exist as sort of a parallel way for people to explore different sides of a narrative. But also there's a lot of nuance to that and a lot of gray area in terms of privilege of where you're coming at that from, what your real life is like and things like that. But I just, I think it's very interesting because uh, when you say LARP to someone on the street, the thing they picture is people hitting each other with pool noodles and like in reality, you're you're acting on a lot, a lot more and thinking a lot more and being a lot more intentional. Yes. Yes. And culturally, there's also so much lore that whether it's conscious or not, gets put in to this new story you're creating. So I am playing a LARP in just a couple of weeks called Way of a Hero. It's a superhero game that my friend Terry Crew wrote. And you are a superhero. Well, my superhero, her name is Wild Banshee, and she is a Banshee. She is from Ireland. And I'm using this cultural folklore that came across the ocean (laughs) with my family and has survived, you know, through several generations and has inspired me to read more on it as a live action role playing character and into the lore of the actual story that we're telling. And in this way, it's like, I don't, I don't have kids. I can't have kids. I never will. But I'm enabling my culture and my heritage to survive by telling the story and introducing this lore in a new way to new people that have different backgrounds than I do in a way that not only entertains them, but engages them and makes them actually care about this. Stuff like that is really rewarding. I did not expect to learn most of the things I learned talking with Tara. That was such an unexpected interview really made me think about LARPing in a completely different way. And I think everybody that's listening will have learned something from this too. So thank you so much to Tara for reaching out on Facebook and uh, making time for us and sharing your wisdom and your experience. This has been a, a really rich interview. So thank you. Cool. And so we'll cut there. I'll put the credits and links in the show notes. Um, 
We should find a way to get our discord out there more. Yeah. I mean, we should find interesting ways to talk about it. Um, the, like the community we have there is really cool. They're really, um, there's a lot of fun discussion. There's some days where I absolutely can't keep up with it. I spent a lot of time building the discord too. And we keep adding stuff, you know, based on what people are asking about, but like there is a link for it in the show notes, but I feel like we should talk about it. Yeah. And so, um, uh, maybe we just put a little little bit here. I'll I'll start off. You can jump in. <clears throat> Check out our Discord. There's a link in the show notes, and I think you'll really enjoy getting involved with the community that's been established and the community that continues to grow. You think that's enough? That seems kind of like marketing copy. Do you think that's good enough? I, I, I mean, I don't want to oversell it. I guess that's true. Oh, and our Patreon. We never mentioned our Patreon. Yeah, yeah, we do have a Patreon that's growing as well. Let me uh, let me do something. Or, or do you want to do Patreon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That way it'll alternate. Sweet. Um, I don't know what else to say, but um, <clears throat> check out our pa- check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash digital folklore. It pays for Digby's vet bills. Check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash digital folklore and help pay for Vig <laughs> for Vigby and help pay for Digby's vet bills. I guess that covers it. Um, yeah, we got uh, Discord. We talked about some Patreon. Oh, you e- sent me that email the other day about maybe doing like unplugged sessions or something like episodes with just the bare bones, like yeah. just running. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I was thinking about is, um, and maybe we can make an announcement on this too. There's a lot of great interview segments that we have that don't fit within the narrative frame. And there's also people that enjoy the segments uh, of interviews that we have that really want more and more of that. So I want to find ways to give really everybody in our audience a chance to enjoy the flavor of episode that they want. So I think we, we want to lean into some of these more unplugged episodes more and more often. What I'm thinking is kind of every other week interspersed with the the more sound design episodes that we have now. Gotcha. Yeah. My only, my only concern would be if it throws people off, uh, as they go through it, but I mean, hopefully they would sort of pick up on it. We can figure out a way to title them. Yeah. Well, may may even just call them unplugged. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I kind of like that. Yeah. It's, it's better than naked folklore. Yeah. It's definitely better than naked folklore. It's like naked and afraid, like the discovery channel show. R- right. Yeah. Um, Oh, also, uh, Ariel and the Trailer Park podcast, they're going to pick apart our trailer, right? And yeah, really give us a give us a um, a stern tear down stern review. So I'll give you the background on that because you saw the email chain. Ariel mentioned that uh, some people had said that they are too nice about the trailers that are on the Trailer Park podcast. And I I offered us up as a sacrifice and said, if you want to tear apart a trailer that we, we know is good in a lot of respects, but also missed a couple very critical things, um, then go ahead and use ours. Yeah, and, and I'm a sucker for harsh criticism. I need something to uh, beat myself up with. So I'm really excited to see what they, to see what they have to say. Yeah. That, now that doesn't mean go in and leave negative re- reviews. <laughs> no, uh, please don't. Yeah, just because we like harsh criticism, we like that har- harsh criticism, like in email. Yeah, re- reviews is a different thing. So review us if you like us. Um, we we love good reviews, and if you think we can do better, we would love to get an email from you and be able to chat about ways that we can meet uh, whatever you think you would like in a show. You want me, I'll tuck that into the credits too. I think that's good. I'll just cut out the sweet. Yeah. So that, all right, I'll hit stop and we're good. I think, I think we're good. Yeah. We, I, think, I think that's about it. I'll just, I'll shoot you an email if we need any retakes. Okay. Yeah. I can record some stuff in the booth later if you need it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll just get to chopping this up. That you, Perry, you, you, that means. Uh, oh, I should go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. I have snacks in the car anyway. Well, gosh, now I feel mean about it. You could ask a person to stay for a while. It's not always just about the business stuff. I can, I'll, I'll make us some sandwiches. I was hoping, do you, do you have those like uh, Totino's pizza rolls that I saw you eating the other day? Actually, yeah, I just got a case of them. They, they come in cases?